What's going on, yo? It's your boy, Keep It Mike. You listen to 102.9 Take Deck, and this is the trilogy of the manifestation in Cuba, episode three. I pretty much made my own trilogy for the radio show because, you know, I fight for liberation in Cuba and it won't stop if the dictator, dictatorship falls down. Um, right now, I have a man who's very important to the community, a pillar to the community. Um, and it's crazy because this thing called the Internet takes you to takes you a lot of places and you end up meeting people that you never think you'll meet. You see them on TV and on YouTube and, you know, just with the connection and networking, you meet some great people. He is one of them. His name is Dr. Orlando Gutierrez Borona. Como esta, hermano? Muy bien, hermano. Glad to be here. Uh, yes, thank you for taking time of this busy schedule. I know you have a lot going on, so I won't waste your time and get to it. Um, first and foremost, um, how do you feel after the last two weeks going on after March 17th? Michael, it froze. I, I couldn't hear the question. Oh, hold on. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, but it froze there and I couldn't hear the question. Oh, okay. Um, let's try it one more time. Okay. Um, it's been two weeks after March 17th. Can you tell me how you feel, your emotions? Your mental health, everything behind after March 17. How you feel, man? I think I think uh, I feel great. I, I feel great faith in the Cuban people. I think that there's a nonviolent grassroots popular movement growing in Cuba, seeking what Cubans have have, have sought throughout their history: freedom, libertad. And I see the the proud and good people of of Santiago de Cuba, Bayamo, Manzanillo. That's the that's where Cuban identity was born. And I see them in the streets being disciplined in their nonviolence, resisting repression and calling for change, calling for the right to elect their own leaders, calling for the right to be free, calling for, for access to food and to basic items which communism regulates and the dictatorship keeps from the people. So I feel very proud of my people. I feel pretty very proud of those who are, who are on the streets protesting. And I must say, since July 11, 2021, the protests haven't stopped. Cubans have not stopped going to the streets since that day. Uh, the demonstrations that took place March 17th have been the largest, but it's an ongoing uh, popular movement, organic movement for change. Yes, and uh, just a two-part question. Where were you when this happened? Because I always ask people, you know, because I interviewed a couple of people, where were you when this happened and what was your reaction? I was in my house and I got a phone call from uh, Antunes, Antunes is a former political prisoner who spent 18 years in Castro's prisons, um, often referred to as the Mandela of Cuba. Um, and he told me, our brothers in the East have risen. There, there's, there's demonstrations. And I began to see what was coming out little by little through videos. And, um, you know, seeing those thousands of young people peacefully demonstrating in the streets of Bayamo, in a country where there's so much fear, where demonstrations are put down all the time, seeing them march in the streets of Bayamo and singing the Cuban National Anthem. The Cuban National Anthem was composed in Bayamo, in that city. And singing that anthem when they were faced by police repression, it just, you know, activated and multiplied every single Cuban cell in my body because that is the, the apex of our history. That's, that's the circle coming around uh, fully. Uh, Cubans connecting with their roots, with the roots in the independence struggle, in the anti-slavery struggle to combat this new... Uh, colonialist and, and, and slave ideology, which is communism. And, and what was your feeling? Was it like another sense of optimistic? Because that's another thing too. I'm hearing like a kind of like a lot of people were happy that was going, it was that was happening again. But then you still have some people that say uh, there's another one. There's like nothing's going to change. So was there like another sense of optimism this time around? Like not giving up well, on people. It's not optimism in the in that I think that every everything in the future will be better. It's optimism in that I know that what they're doing is right. It's true. It's it, it reflects reality. It reflects the most reasonable of petitions, and therefore I know it'll win. And those of us who've been studying the Cuban social movement for years know that they've reached a stage now where the streets belong to the people, and when the people want to take the streets, they take them. And that consciousness of struggle will lead to to reconquering freedom and reestablishing democracy in Cuba. Hmm. There's something that's been bugging me, and maybe you might be the person that might could give could, could probably give me the answer with this. What is it about Cuba that is not getting the same attention as to oppose what's going on with Israel and Palestine? 
with me because, you know, me living in Massachusetts, I didn't see it, you know, on CNN or NBC, not even on Fox News. And they're pretty much Republican. That's something that Cubans vote heavily. And I did not see it this time around as big as it was with July 11th. So what is it about us that doesn't get the attention it should be? I think the answer is complex. I think in general, there's a bias against news from Latin America in U.S. media. How much news do you see about Latin America, period? And there's some very important things going on in Latin America. I think that also there's a lack of consistent coverage about the, the Antilles, the Caribbean. How much news do we see about Cuba, Haiti, Puerto Rico? There's, there's Jamaica, uh, Bahamas. There's a very general bias against the news from there. Number three, you know, Cuba is conveniently, conveniently used as a model for those who want to advocate socialism in their own countries. So when there's bad news coming out of Cuba, those elites, which are in key institutions, which generate news, don't want the world to know that communism doesn't work in Cuba, socialism doesn't work in Cuba, and the people of Cuba are rising against the so-called People's Republic because it doesn't represent them. So I think it's a combination of an overall bias against news from Latin America um, and also as a, a general bias uh, uh, on Cuba because of ideology. And also because we, we can't underestimate, underestimate the, the extreme, uh, extremely dangerous conflicts taking place in Ukraine, taking place in Israel, taking place in Taiwan. Uh, you know, those are very powerful events. They're very newsworthy, and they do monopolize attention. So I think it's a combination of all these factors. That's it. Okay, that's a good point because even when they, even when they, when I, you know, when I see like the articles on the internet, and even when I see things on the news, um, one of the thing that bugs me is when you see the coverage is you see Cuba protesting for food, electricity, food and electricity, and you barely hear them say also protesting at the government. And if you do see a sentence like that, it's like this small. It's like they talk about it really, really brief, and they just bypass that and talk about the food, the water, electricity, and somewhere around it is the somewhere around it is like the embargo's fault. So it's just it's just frustrating. You know, it's it's. Uh, I just want to mention this, Michael, and I think it's an important fact. Up to 1959, Cuba was an agricultural power. Mm -hmm. Cuba fed itself, which is very difficult for a developing country to do, and it exported food. Cuba was competitive in the U.S. markets in agri agricultural products. The communist statist policies, which took effective control of the land and its and it, and the crops and the animals from Cuban farmers and turned them over to the state, crippled Cuban agricultural uh, uh, production. And we're at the point where Cuba imports 100% of what it eats. So thanks to communism, Cuba is more dependent than ever on the U.S., on Canada, on other European powers that feed it. Um, and that's happened under communism. Cuba was far more independent in its food production uh, under the governments of the republic before communism uh, than it is now. So the embargo doesn't cover food. Cuba wouldn't eat if the embargo covered food because they're getting the food from, from uh, democratic countries. They're getting it from Europe. They're getting it from the US. They're getting it from Canada. Um, so what, you, what we're seeing in Cuba is a poverty that has been brought about in what, what, what was once one of the most prosperous countries in Latin America by failed communist policies. They don't work. They don't work when you, when you insert the state into the daily lives of individuals and you control their ability to grow, to work, to prosper, to produce, to own. Cubans don't own their own labor. Cubans don't own their own, their own property. Cubans have every single economic freedom restricted by the state. And that has led to the generalized poverty that you see in the island. And on top of that, you have a highly restrictive society where there's no freedom of the press. There's no freedom of education. Religious uh, expression is persecuted. So you, you created a terrible situation where people don't want to live under those conditions. And they keep on rising for freedom. Uh, but the regime has proven, because of its repressive ability, capable of putting down these revolts, but they will continue until we are free again, because that is a, the great uh, commandment. That is the the great need of Cuban history, that Cubans find their freedom. You know, um, there, there's so much I want to unpack here, and we got a little time here, but um, now I got to put my conspiracy hat for a quick second, because it's funny you mentioned, I spoke to my mother today, and you just mentioned like next to America, Cuba was probably like the most produced country in the Western hemisphere. So my mother, you know, 
one thing about Cubans, especially people from her age, they're paranoid and their conspiracy bug is like through the roof. So she said that, you know, it's probably what's a setup that the America didn't want us to succeed because we were so dependent within ourselves that we didn't need it. And I know during that time, America was very like had their hands on, on other Latin uh, um, Latin American countries. That to the point that Cuba was like, you know, we, we could pretty much succeed without y'all. And she said, um, you know, it's something about that because if like if you guys saw against communism, but then you let this man take over and didn't even bother put up a fight, you know, it's something that doesn't sit right within the 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 situation. But um one of the things that I um well that I also want to talk about real quick, um the, with the UN, every year they're always big on lifting up the embargo, except for um you the US and Israel. What what is it with the UN that we all know what's going on, but still they want to back up the dictatorship with their oppressive ways. What is it with them that, for whatever reason, you know, even though everybody in the world know what's going on, they still want to side with the dictatorship. They still want them to have that part that we know that they can't have, which is the embargo being lifted. Yeah, I'm. you know, I'm going to link your mom's thought and with what happens in the UN, if you'll give me a few minutes. Yeah. I don't think your mom's, I don't think your mom's totally wrong. Um, the most impressive economic miracle in Latin America in the 20th century was Cuba's growth from the moment of independence in 1902 to the moment of the downfall of the Republic in 1959. In the first 10 years of independence, uh, Cuban production increased almost at a 20% level. It was amazing. Cuba independence was the best option for Cubans, and Cubans, with what they had, they began to build a very solid foundation of, of democracy. Um, by the 1950s, the Cuban peso was on par with the dollar. Cuba had some of the largest gold reserves of all, La of all Latin America. In terms of salaries, in terms of literacy, Cuba was leading the hemisphere. Now, I do believe that there was, within the U.S. government and, and U.S. civil society, was a, there was a strong leftist movement, which saw socialism in Cuba as very convenient in order to sell socialism in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very well documented how people within the State Department even people within the CIA helped Castro come to power in the 1950s. I'm not defending Batista. It was a dictatorship. It was a dictatorship. Uh, it was a, an authoritarian state where there were still a lot of freedoms because it was an open free press that criticized Batista, that published Fidel Castro's articles. There was a Congress with opposition members in Congress that also voted against the government. So there was an independent labor, labor union movement, et cetera, et cetera, which doesn't compare which pales in comparison to the total restriction on freedoms we have in Cuba today. Um, it's a myth that Cuban governments were completely subservient to Washington or controlled by, by Washington. Over and over again, Cuban governments stood up to the U.S. and knew how to negotiate and knew how to broaden their own field of expertise. Um, for example, the first time Cuba sold sugar to the Soviet Union was under Batista, not under Castro, because Cuban governments you know, were very conscious of the independence of Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that that in the minds of many leftist ideologues in the U.S., and to this day, to this day, Noam Chomsky is still doing it. Socialism in Cuba was a convenient myth to propagate and advocate for socialism in their own countries. And Fidel Castro's speech, what he said, fit right into what these people were, were calling for. Um, very slow growth of the population, low consumption, uh, Castro would pride himself on that, you know, to the point that Cuba today has a negative, uh, has, a, has a negative birth rate. Cuba is a Latin American country that is not reproducing itself. Every year there are fewer Cubans. That's a result of communism. It's a result of status policies which wreck the ability of the country to produce and grow. So I don't think your mom's totally wrong. And I think that many of the governments in the UN reflect this ideology of trying to justify socialism through Cuba. It's not about what Cuba needs. It's not about what Cuba as a reality has a right to. It's about trying to justify an ideology based on the on the on the poverty and on, on the on the wretched life of a good people. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I made sense of what I told you, but it's what I feel when I've studied and 
Per perfect sense. But that's 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 why I need you here for these minutes, man. That's why I need you here. And the people from Boston needs to hear this because one of the things that I always talked about with um shout out to Kia and y Yvette. Every time I speak to them, it's like we got to get this information out outside of Miami because every time we talk about Cuba, they think it's a Miami thing or it's a Republican Miami thing or it's a white Cuban thing. And they're like, no, my mom feel it the way you feel it. My father feels the way they feel it. It's it's a Cuban thing. So if you're Cuban, you're equally oppressed, oppressed and all messed up. So we have to send this information out and try to give as much um um gems as we can to the audience because a lot of people don't know what's going on especially here in massachusetts so i try to do my part and try to give enough, as much as that um information as possible and it's crazy because i wasn't even born in cuba i was born in the states but just hearing what you know my my parents went through what my grandfather went through because he that's a whole nother episode you know like i just had to bury him and he died when i was in you know a free cuba so now i'm taking that more personal than ever so I, I, I just wanted to do my part to, to, to serve the community. Michael, it makes me very proud to know you and to hear you. I will say this. Cuba, ha, Cuba is a unique national identity, as unique as our soil. The Cuban soil is unique in the world because of its combinations of minerals and its fertility. It took communism to make that soil infertile, and it will be fertile again. The same thing with Cuban national identity. You can't project onto Cuba the history of the U.S., Cuba has a unique identity. It has unique racial relations that were developed over time in Cuba. Uh, the components of Cuban national identity are more complex than most Americans understand about how we see ourselves and how we deal with, with ourselves. So, you know, it makes me feel, even when it comes from, from left-wingers, or especially from left-wing people, that there's an attempt at ideological colonization of Cuba. They want to summarize, they want to simplify the history, the history of my nation to satisfy, to satisfy somebody else's ideological mm -hmm. narrative. No, Cubans are a reality, man. They're, they're a reality with a deep history, with, with very complex symbols and meanings in, in, our, in our own history. And those cannot be simplified down to Fidel Castro and his nine-hour speeches in front of captive masses. <laughs> yeah, they were long as hell. Um, can, you, uh, can you tell my audience the event that happened a couple of days after the March 18th? And um, I, was that in um, was that at the museum of the Bay of Pigs? The event that happened um, on on. Cause I saw pictures out there. That I, there's the speech with El Funky, yourself. Oh Kino. yeah, yeah. We had a, we had a really good event. We had an event at um, at something called uh, La Casa del Preso Político, the home of former Cuban political prisoners. All right. And in in that event, we showed dozens of videos which have arrived from Cuba where the Cuban people from housewives to workers to farmers to students are calling for a national strike, a nonviolent means through which to, through which to bring about change in the island. Um, and then uh, El Funky, who's a very well-known Grammy Award winning rapper, he had a national strike. This is an idea that is coming from different committees throughout Cuba who are advocating this nonviolent type of resistance in order to bring about change in Cuba. And we had a very successful press conference with a lot of press, a lot of people were participating. And, you know, I love Assembly of the Cuban Resistance events because they're a sample. They're, a, they're, they're a, good, a good way to see that diversity of Cuba, that diversity and the unity of Cuba. And uh, that event was really a very important event. And I think there's going to be more, more coming about that song. That song has taken off. It's got dozens of people seeing it in Cuba and abroad, and uh, I'm very happy. I'm very proud to know Funky to be con to consider him my friend, and he's very creative. And this song is is uh, is a very powerful song. And don't you worry about a ticket. I'm playing that song tonight, so <laughs> I'm playing it for the for the station. So uh, great, yes, great. So um, we're gonna yeah, talk. Definitely. We're gonna let, let let's talk. Let's talk more about. There's more news coming with that song. Yeah, bet. Uh, well, um, we'll we'll talk later. We'll talk later after, about that song, but um. Couple of things we get out of here. Um, and afterwards, there was a, a there was a manifestation on on last Sunday. Was oh yeah, Sunday? that was a yeah, yeah man, that was a we called for for a walk for freedom, and in support of the national strike in Cuba, in a historic section of Little Havana, we walked from the Bay of Pigs Monument to the home of the former political prisoners. We had hundreds of people come out on on a Sunday morning, on an Easter yeah. Sunday morning. We had uh, no, not Easter Sunday it was a. Uh, the week before, 
And we had hundreds of people come out, a lot of media. And there we stated we stated our support for that nonviolent movement in Cuba for change, for our people in the streets, and for the time that Cubans can regain their freedom. Cubans are not less than anybody else. Cubans have the same right to freedom of speech, to freedom of association, freedom of religion, freedom to elect their own leaders that anybody else in the world has. And, and, and I'm tired of Cubans being discriminated out of some kind of, of obeisance to this, this primitive socialist ideology. No, Cubans have the right to, to pick where they want to go, who they want to go with, and how they do it. And that return of sovereignty to the Cuban people is the goal of our life. Okay, well said, well said. Two more questions before we get out of here. Um, after March 17, what has been the ordeal with Cuba, meaning like any number of people that have been jailed, um, arrested or missing, any any number on that right now? I know any... of, a, we know of at least 50 arrests from the yeah. demonstrations in Santiago and Bayamo of young people. We're getting yeah. more and more information now. Um, but the regime is fearful. They know they're facing a giant. The giant is that the Cuban nation is awakening. The Cuban nation is finding its strengths in itself. And when I see young Cubans and Cubans marching on the streets and using their flag and their national anthem as the symbols of resistance, I know that I know that they're breaking with communist indoctrination. They're breaking with totalitarianism in their mind, and they're and they're affirming that there's more to Cuban, there's more to Cuba than communism. There's far more to Cuba than communism. Communism is a dark chapter in Cuban history, but mm -hmm. the rest of Cuban history is full of potential for for that for, for the Cuban people to find happiness and to find freedom at last. And my last question: um, the protest that happened that you went to on, in DC, um, um, two weeks ago, I think it was. That yeah, you, we um, did a pro we, we, protest by, by by the embassy. You know, I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to speak about this. That vicious regime in Cuba has sent Cuban soldiers to fight all of Russia's wars. Cubans were sent to fight in Angola, were sent to fight in Ethiopia, were sent to fight in Algeria. They even fought in the Middle East against Israel. And now they're being sent to fight with the Russian army in Ukraine, invading the, the Ukrainian people. Um, I think over a dozen Cubans have already been killed in that, in that war, in that imperialist war of Russia against Ukraine. That terrible thing that's going on. Yeah. And also... Um, uh, a Cuban has been captured, and he has been shown by the Ukrainian authorities. Um, so we want to demonstrate against the, the regime that is sending these young men to fight in a war that has nothing to do with Cuba, nothing to do with our values or our interests, and against a peaceful people, the Ukrainians, who've never heard Cuba. And we had a demonstration in front of the of the intersection of the Cuban embassy, I'm sorry, in Washington, yeah. D.C. Well, I mean... There's so, there's so much I want to say with so little time. But again, thank you, my friend, for taking the time, taking your time, your busy, busy schedule. Um, you definitely got to come to Boston and do this on 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 air, live at the station. Looking um, forward to it. Yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely try to get you up here soon. Um, we're gonna we're gonna end the show here with Pate Villa for, for you guys, because as you know, that's been the national anthem I've been playing every time I bring a Cuban issue out here. But this has been your boy, Keeping Mike. Orlando, thank you again for taking time thank on your you, schedule. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely go do some work. We're definitely going to talk. And again, guys, um, you know what I do here when I talk about the situation, man. I ain't stopping until Cuba's free, till my people is free. If you're a combination, I'm a goddamn friend. Till next week, y'all. 6 to 7, 102.9 Tape Deck.